first off, for anyone concerned, this is the blockchain talk. We're just going to go through a bit first about some of the open source stuff we have done and why we decided that the smart identity platform that we're building had to be open source or should be open source. So first of all, I'm going to talk about what is open source software, which I'm sure pretty much everybody here knows, but just covers a couple of the advantages and disadvantages for us in the industry and why that makes sense again with a smart contract. Then a bit about some of the open source stuff we've done before now to bring in, like building up a bit of the time to what we're doing now and the journey that me and Karen have been part of trying to take our blockchain solution from a web app that we built through to an uh, open source block that other people could actually use. Uh, then I'm going to pass over to Karen, who's going to talk actually about the blockchain technology itself and the Ethereum and the smart contracts and how it's all put together. <coughs> then we're going to go in just a bit about how it's helped us because this is the first time I'd either of us has developed an open source solution and there's a couple of lessons there that we really didn't think about until we actually had to do it. So open source software is software that anyone can code, can inspect, modify or enhance. So the advantages and disadvantages there for us are they're kind of twofold because they apply the advantage quite often the disadvantage as well. So first off, the disadvantage is from a security perspective. Anybody can look at your code straight off the bat. Anyone can understand how it works, potentially see a problem. And that, that's an issue if you're a malicious user. If you're a good user, that's only going to help us because you're going to contribute back to the system. And that's quite important for, I don't know how many people here keep up with the blockchain news or the Ethereum news or what's happening in the industry. So there was an exploit a while back called the DAO exploit where someone found an issue in one of these contracts that was open source and rather than report it they were just able to slowly drain money out of an account like one transaction at a time over a period of a day and no one could do anything but watch the money go. So it's important that people understand these smart contracts then and the more eyes, I think as the founder of Linux said, with enough eyes all bugs are shallow and the more people we have looking at it, the more people understand the smart contracts, the more effective they'll be. Then the other one is, which is the big one for us as a consultancy company, is perception. So before, you could just write your code and no one would ever really see what's going on in the background. They'd only see your front end and how it performs and the bits that they were interested in. Whereas now, a bit like being a craftsman or an artist, somebody can look at how your code is written and how it's built and you can be judged on that before you even give it to someone. And that's important for us because then if we do build it well, as you see with a couple of the bigger open source communities, you get people involved and people want, people want to promote you on their own and want to help document the system. So a couple of notable except, uh, open source products are sort of Git, Chrome, Android, Apache, Docker. I've, most of you guys here probably know more about it than I do. But then we have some of the things here that are dependent on it. And in the honorable mentions section here, I thought these were kind of important based on what I said previously, uh, where things like your router or your smart things or your car, once they, we get fully autonomous, it's, it's fundamental that we find these bugs in any of those systems really quickly in the same way that it's fundamental that we find bugs in any of the smart contracts very quickly because if there was ever to be a problem like the DAO again, you don't want somebody us accidentally passing over the ownership of your passport to some non completely different. So a wee bit about some of the open source th that we have noticed in the company over the past few years. In the last kind of six, seven years, we've noticed 36% more p clients are now using open source software than they were before. And that's across massive <coughs> e-commerce systems and banks and other financial industries. And the majority of the tools that we use to build are open source, so the Java, the .NET, the, so we're using Java and Spring and Ethereum, which Karen's going to go into, which are all open source products to develop a web app that, that we're building around this open source smart identity platform. So we, f in Deloitte, we find and maintain our own projects as well as contributing to a number of others. So this is a list of some of the projects that we've kind of founded or maintained over the years. So CoreJet's uh, in the top left here. Some of you may know them, some of you may not. It was just a requirements scale. It was a way to, to write tests based on your requirements system. And then we have things like Imposter, which was a mock-in framework, and Plone, which is a CMS. And then we have test containers, which is just a way to write, to 
spin up databases and web servers inside your JUnit tests in Java. And the kind of the two interesting ones here I want to talk about just before I pass on to Karen is the API Man, which is an existing piece of software by Red Hat that we just contribute to to the CLI of it and help expand that. Now and we also use now use it in our smart identity platform. And the last one is this React one in the middle. So this is to represent the React starter app that some of the guys in the office made. So three of our analysts and one of our senior consultants worked on building. It's quite often when you start a project, you don't really know where to start, and it kind of takes a while to get it up and running. And th this just highlights that not all open source solutions have to be have to be a great idea or a great system or a way to solve a new problem. Sometimes it's just a way to solve a simple problem that we all have, and it's sometimes it's not thought about, and it's just another way to give back to the community in the same way of writing a blog or getting involved in one of these events. So, Karen and I work together, or have been working together for the past six months or so, taking the smart chain plot, uh, the smart identity platform, from a POC through to the system that we intend to open source in the following months. Uh, I'll pass over to Karen, and he will run you through actually a bit about the blockchain and the smart identity platform and how it's all going to work. Thanks, Jimmy. Um, so just uh, suppose starting off to provide a wee background in blockchain uh, for those who don't know it. Um, the blockchain is a distributed ledger of time-stamped uh, time transactions um, that store and update data that's uh, stored on the network. Um, the original implementation uh, of blockchain, uh, I suppose, is well known. It's, it's the Bitcoin uh, uh, platform um, and that itself is an open source platform and um, that launched in 2008 but that wasn't the very first or initial um, concept for cryptocurrency earlier attempts were made at developing cryptocurrencies uh, mostly these were scuppered due to the elements that you see in the left hand side um, surrounding cryptocurrency or sorry cryptography and peer-to-peer -peer networking uh, time stamping and digital signatures. Um, again, a white paper in 2008 by the elusive Satoshi Nakamoto um, delivered a solution which encompassed all of these ideas uh, into um, what is now known as the Bitcoin blockchain. Um, over time, that uh, cryptocurrency has gone uh, and had, had its ups and downs, but it's, it's steadily progressed. Um, until a stage in around 2013 uh, when another white paper by uh, another very intelligent uh, computer scientist named Vitalik Buterin identified two of the, the newer concepts that can be implemented with blockchain, which you can see uh, are smart contracts and the digital ID. Um, yep. So smart contracts, um, that white paper by uh, Buterin in 2013 um, outlined an earlier uh, white paper that was uh, published by Nick Szabo in 1996. Uh, in that, Nick Szabo said um, that basically a smart contract is a set of promises specified in digital form, including protocols within which parties perform on these uh, premises or promises. Sorry. So uh, I suppose if you break that down, your, your promise is your legal agreement. Um, your protocol is your business logic, um, and you know obviously the parties that perform. Um, that there is is actually the the peers acting on the network. Um, that's uh, the the genesis of uh, Ethereum, the Ethereum network, which is what Jamie and I work on. More recently than that, uh, Deloitte worked with the Chamber of Digital Commerce in the USA and. They uh, produced a white paper on smart contracts and their use cases. The number one use case outlined in that white paper is the use case for digital identity. Yep. Um, so that led us to uh, look at developing our own version of a smart contract. Um, again, this is just a small snippet of the code that we developed um, based around smart identity. So basically what, what we envisage smart identity uh, being or doing is it gives the user more control over their own identity and how that's shared with 
third parties um, in an automated fashion. Um, in that way, uh, I can create an identity for myself on the blockchain, um, and I can upload attributes such as you know passports, uh, birth certs, uh, licenses, things like that. I can upload the data from those and store that data on the network. And from there, I can pass that to a third party uh, for verification. And that transaction is timestamped and recorded on, on the network so that that's ver verified. The next transaction is also important in that the party that I share my uh, passport or my personal data with also verifies that that is correct and valid and that transaction is stored. So over time, you're developing your digital identity and in the blockchain, each transaction adds to that verification process and makes it a stronger case for uh, building your identity digitally. Um, again, uh, we built that in Solidity, which itself is an open source uh, platform for building smart contracts. We test that with Truffle uh, and test it on test RPC. Again, those, those frameworks are also open source and we wouldn't have been able to you know, go on and build this key uh, part of our um, blockchain development uh, without that open source technology. Um, go ahead. So um, our journey to open source began with building a web app. So I suppose starting off, we might not have necessarily worked out the intricacies of going open source and we approached it like we would have uh, approached any normal project. Um, once the decision was taken to go open source with that, we realized that we actually had to rethink um, aspects of our project, such as the architecture, um, the quality, um, and the building blocks that we were using to um, put our uh, version of, of our uh, platform together. So that meant separating out the logical components uh, with, that make up our web app. Um, as you can see, we've uh, got blockchain, um, well, blockchai, and uh, if you look at the uh, picture, I don't know uh, what happened there, but uh, we've got blockchain separate to our other elements, which can, in our, our view, can be um, mixed or matched or can be uh, replaced with other components uh, in a typical OO uh, style architecture. Um, from there, once we actually had separated out those elements logically, then we had to think about the documentation. And this comes back to our own investigation and experimentation with other blockchain um, technologies, including the likes of multi-chain um, and uh, hydrochain. Uh, from working with other technologies, we realized how important the documentation is. Um, and that's what the sort of small um, page symbol represents there. Um, we know that in order for our open source project to be taken seriously, we need to provide good documentation with that. Um, and that's taken quite a while on top of the development to actually develop itself. After that, um, we had to go through a process of tidy up. And once those, all of those elements were complete, we took that on then to a peer review. That was the first step of the quality assurance uh, that we had to go through in, in Deloitte. Um, excuse me, uh, I suppose that just meant that personally we were checking our own code, making sure everything was tested, passing that on to our, our technical lead so that um, the uh, protocols, the patterns and everything that we had enforced at the start of our project were uh, overseen. Uh, passed that on to the technical architect to ensure that the architecture was sound. And from those checks then we were able to uh, progress to a technical review board. Um, the technical re review board had a more uh, high level um, review of the uh, project and how it was uh, developed. Um, and that finally, once passed, uh, took us to the QRM, um, which is the quality review Management. management. That's currently the um, level that we have, and we're just about to release our uh, smart identity contract on a GitHub repository. So that. Uh
that takes us back to Jimmy, and Jimmy's going to discuss how that helped us um, yeah. on our way. So let's tie this up now. Apologies for the last slide. It's compressed a bit for email. We didn't realize it had gone a bit bad. Yeah. Uh, so just wanted to talk a bit about developing the open source product and what we actually learned from that. Because as Karen was saying, we started off, we built a web app as we understood like how we wanted to solve a smart identity problem and how we wanted to put identities on a blockchain. What we quickly realized is that what we'd effectively built was a house and that can only be, an environment that can only be extended in some ways. You can add an extra room, you can add an extra bit here or there. What we actually needed to provide was a brick and so that more people could build upon this. Because the whole idea with the smart identity and the blockchain itself is it only work, it works better the more people who are involved. Because as Cameron was saying, we have this idea of verification and the verification happens by more people getting involved in this chain. So the more buy-in we get, the, the better and the more people you get on the chain, the better. Because a lot of these blockchains that are going out now are private chains, and then that's only really being verified by the people you already know and the people you've already agreed with. So it's kind of similar to the system we have now. So we wanted to build, we wanted to break it out into these components so that other people could take, say, a module that interacts with a blockchain or a module that saves off a section of the identity or a module that verifies items are on a blockchain. So we developed the front end, we broke that off, and we learned a bit during this about different architectures and how to actually build a small segment that we wanted to release, which is the smart contract is the first segment we wanted to release, which, as Karen says, is going up shortly. Uh, then just a wee bit, just to wrap up about how open source has helped us and helped us learn. So it, it improves your skills because we've been forced to go on to the Ethereum J, which is the library we're using. It's the Java communication library with Ethereum except that all these products are at the minute still in alpha. So it, it's, there's not a whole lot of documentation around it or a whole lot of people doing, well, there's, as everyone knows, there's lots of people doing lots of things with blockchains, but no one's really sharing too much yet. So a lot of it's going on to getters and different instant messages and talking to the people who actually develop these pieces of software and asking them how we solve these problems. And then that helps, that helps kind of then get involved in shaping where that piece of te technology goes, which is kind of, one of the nice things about open source, if you're in early and you're a member of the community, you can help actually shape the product, and that's how you end up with this buy-in. Uh, good for you in that if it, it can help your career. If you're just if you're a student or you're going out, to, it's good to be able to show that you're invested in the community and that you can look at someone else's code and adapt to it. You don't just write it in your own style. And then it's just good to be involved in the community and to keep giving back when you get help. I just pass back to Karen. She's going to do a wee bit about how to get involved in open sourcing, and then we'll let everyone go for lunch and stop blogging. <laughs> um, yeah. So just briefly, um, these are just a few quick tips that we picked up um, from our uh, experience working in open source. Um, the first thing is to start small and submit a patch. Um, again, it might not be the best idea to just launch a brand new version of. Uh, Bitcoin uh, straight away by yourself. Um, so start small. Um, uh, by all means, be ambitious, but submit a patch and obviously have 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 it absolutely thoroughly tested locally first before submitting that patch. Um, ask before starting uh, work uh, to avoid disappointment. So again, uh, I suppose it's about building up your confidence. You, if if you want to uh, become known and develop your reputation and open sourcing, you have to uh, work on it. But your confidence might take a dent if your first uh, contribution is, is turned down. So um, don't be afraid to talk and ask questions. Um, follow project guidelines. So again, it's pretty important. It's, it's something that we've really uh, had to learn and, and try and get nailed uh, is uh, to follow project guidelines so that you know, if I do something one way, somebody else doesn't do it a different way and it ends up confusing people who, who really want to use your code. Um, and again, be accommodating the changes because uh, you know everyone knows code becomes stale. So uh, it's better if things are open to progress. Um, we've made changes uh, to our uh, original project, and that you know hasn't hasn't really caused us any <laughs> problems. But uh, change is, is inevitable. So that's pretty much it. Um, if you have any questions, fire away. If not. Enjoy your pizza. <laughs>